Take your Bibles with me if you would, and we're going to look today at the book of Micah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. That little section called the Minor Prophets, back towards the end of your Old Testament, find the the book of Micah, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. You know, there is within every human heart a desire for better days. Think about it. Here in just a few days, we are going to... uh, ring out the old year, 2015, and we're going to ring in a brand new year. And uh, many will do so with a hope uh, that uh, 2016 will, will be better than 2015. And uh, maybe you've gone through and said, well, 2015 was a pretty good year for me. I had a pretty good time. Everything went pretty well. Well, but we still hope 2016 even goes even better. Others will say, well, 2015 was a struggle, had some difficult times. I hope that it's better this next year. We're always looking and have a desire within our hearts for better days. We live in a world that is filled with all kinds of problems. Turn on the nightly news and you'll see uh, news of violence and and strife and uh, we'll see, you know, the strong oppress the weak, the rich pummel the poor, nations go to war against other nations. We're surrounded on every side it seems with violence and strife. And often, even not only what's going on outside around us causes us difficulty, but but also there's very often a a war that goes on within the human heart. Uh, uh, We find that our desires, we we find that the war against us, we find that there is no peace within our hearts. We were created, we know this. Uh, Our hearts tell us this. We were created for something better. Uh, One of my favorite uh, bands is a band called Switchfoot. In one of their songs, uh, there is a line that just simply says, they repeat it many times, we were made for more than this. We were made for so much more than what we experience. Our hearts have a longing desire. Uh, You know, when we're children, we can't wait to grow up. You remember when you were a kid? You just could not wait to get older. I mean, when I was, uh, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old, I couldn't wait till I turned, you know, became a teenager. Boy, when I get 16 and I get a car and uh, boy, I could be able to drive and boy, I'd be living it up. Then then you turn 16, so well, boy, when I graduate high school, things are gonna be good. When I I graduate college, things are gonna be so good. And, And somewhere along the line, I don't know what happens, but there's a change that goes, boy, I wish I could go back you know what I'm saying? And I wish I'd go back and be 18 again. I wish I could be 20 again. Uh, we're always looking for better days. Most people who have ever lived on this earth have looked forward to better days but never found them. The Bible promises us that there are better days ahead. In the Old Testament, we find promise after promise after promise that something better is getting ready to come along. The ancient Jews had a word for this. They called it shalom. You'll see that that very word in verse five. Let's read these first five verses together and you will see that word mentioned here. It says, now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem of Paphrath, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient of days. Therefore, he shall give to them uh, uh, until uh, give them up until the times when he who is in labor has given birth. That then the rest of his brothers shall return of the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. He shall be their peace, or shalom. That word shalom there uh, refers, uh, it, it, we often translate it just as peace, you know, and, and uh, when I was growing up, you know, uh, my, my brothers were older than me, and they kind of grew up in the 1960s, and, uh, you know, I remember my brother had a wooden uh, pole uh, that he kept in his bedroom. Every time I'd get a chance, I'd go and get to play with it. It was just a big, it was a long, with, 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 a, with a hand on it, with a peace sign on it. 
all right? And, uh, and I love that thing. I'd go in there and get it every once in a while. And, uh, you know, everybody thought uh, of peace as just simply as the absence of war, if we could end war and strife. But, but when the Jews talk about peace, uh, they have something more in mind. It's not just uh, an absence of war, but, but rather it is a positive state in our soul. It's a private transaction between God and the individual. The longing for, solo, for shalom uh, included those things, but, but, but it had a, had a big and a broad idea. It had this idea of an inner spiritual peace. It meant wholeness and completeness throughout all of creation. It meant the, the end of injustice. It meant that the rich would no longer devour the poor. It meant that all the brokenness and sadness and difficulty that we have in this world would one day come to an end. Now, the, the Jews had had this promise of shalom, this promise of peace all the way through. And as the story of the Bible unfolds, God would occasionally drop clues that, that would awaken our hearts and, and cause us to long uh, for these better days to come along. But but as, it becomes, as the revelation goes on, we begin to realize that this hope for peace becomes embodied in a person, becomes embodied in an individual. Uh, it become, uh, This is the way Isaiah said, the prophet Isaiah said, for to us to a child is born, to us a son is given, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And so the question continued on throughout the ages. Who is this, this coming Savior? Who is this, this one who will bring us peace? And so Micah begins to look at it. First of all, Micah in this passage looks back and he remembers the promise of peace. He goes back and he thinks about all that God has been saying. Now you have to understand, Micah is writing about 700 years before Jesus was born. If you go back to chapter one, you find out he is writing in about the same period of time that the prophet Isaiah was writing. He was writing during the, the, the reigns of, of Ahaz and Jotham and, and Hezekiah. Now uh, Hezekiah goes down as one of the best kings that Israel had, ever had, but Ahaz was one of the worst kings. Ahaz was a king. In fact, we just looked at him uh, a few Sunday nights ago uh, when we were going through Chronicles and talked about how awful and terrible of a, of a, of a king that he was and how he introduced all kinds of, of immorality and idolatry and, and all of this corruption into the nation of Israel and, and how it had gone downhill. And in the midst of that, God begins to remind them that, that there, this isn't the way it's always going to be. That, that there is a promise out there that something better was just around the way. Uh, Micah was, uh, like I said, lived about 700 years before Jesus was born. He, he came from a small town, a, a, well, actually it wouldn't be a mid-sized town called Moraseth. He was about 25 miles south of Jerusalem, and his name, Micah, means to see. Now, like the other prophets, Micah saw things that everyone else wanted to ignore. Hey, that's the problem with being a preacher. That's the problem with being a, 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 uh, uh, one who's going to speak on behalf of God. You've got to see things that maybe nobody else wants to see. Everybody in the nation wants to see prosperity. They want to see easy times. They want to see all the good. And sometimes you have to see the bad. And you will notice here that, that Micah's message of hope also begins with a message that, that there's going to be some problems. Uh, verse one, he says, now muster you troop, your, your troops, O daughters of troops. Siege is laid against us. And with a rod, they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. He's talking about the fact that there is going to be some difficult times there's going to be some struggles. He's talking about there, about the Assyrian armies coming to attack the nation of Israel. But in the midst of that, he begins to say, there's something more coming. You look around you and you see all the problems. You look around you and you see all the difficulties, but, but there is a promise that something bigger is coming. Back in chapter four, verse three, he predicted that someone who, who would judge between many peoples and would settle disputes or uh, other strong nations far and wide is going to arise. He's saying there's someone 
coming. Under this person's leadership, the nations would beat their plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. The nations will not take a sword against nation, uh, nor will they even train for war anymore. He says there is a coming time of peace that is just out there. Now this is a wonderful sentiment uh, that sometimes people have uh, either forgotten or they've made the other uh, counter mistake of idealized it. Um, Back in the 1960s, I was watching a document. I love walking, watching documentaries. We got Netflix this year, and I'm addicted to documentaries. I watch documentaries all day long. Uh, if you let some people binge watch, you know, TV programs, I binge watch, binge watch documentaries. All right. I was watching a documentary about Peter, Paul, and Mary. How many of you remember Peter, Paul, and Mary? Old 1960s, you know, uh, folk group, all right? And, uh, and uh, uh, they, they, they were talking about, you know, back in the 60s, the folk musicians, uh, you know, a lot of Joan Baez and Bob Dylan and Peter, Paul and Mary and, and others thought that, that they were on the verge of seeing something world changing come into the world. They really believe that through their music and through this sort of channeled youth movement that was coming in, that they would actually see the cessation of all war. They would see a virtual utopia break out. You know, John and Yoko Yono, uh, John Lennon and Yoko Yono, uh, blah, blah, blah. you try to say that up here, all right? Yoko Ono, or okay, anyway, Yoko Ono. Um, man, I can't say that for anything today. Uh, you know, his wife. And um, they thought that, you know, if you just had this series of protests, if you just had this collective consciousness, that there would be some sort of peace that would come about. If you look back through history, you'll see that many periods of time thought that was about to happen. There were numerous moments in the life. Uh, during the Renaissance, they thought that was going to happen. Uh, in the early parts of the, uh, of, the, of the centuries, Christian centuries, in Roman Empire, they thought they were on the verge of seeing peace on earth. And yet, every time, it came up short. Anymore, about the only time you ever hear about peace on earth, we've just kind of assumed that that's not going to happen. We've just assumed that there is no peace on earth. But in the midst of our hopelessness, our frustration, our cynicism, by the way, not only do we see that as a world and as a nation, we see it as individuals. More and more I talk to people who say, I have no sense of peace in my life. I have no sense of joy in my life. I have no sense of contentment in my life. In fact, I'm gonna say this to you very bluntly. The younger you are, the more likely that you are facing that exact problem. It's a very odd uh, and unusual characteristic of our generation that there almost is a utter lack of peace and contentment in the hearts of people today. You think about that. Yesterday, I met my wife and daughter over to mall. I can only stay for about 20 minutes because that's about all of the mall that I can take, all right? But I went over there, and, and you watched people running about, going crazy. You know what they were all doing? They were all returning the gifts that they didn't like from the day before to get something that they thought would give them more peace. And guess what they're probably going to do tomorrow? They're going to take back the stuff they bought yesterday, and they're going to find out it didn't bring me peace. It didn't bring me contentment. We've got to understand that there's the only thing that will bring us peace in the world is Jesus Christ. And in the midst of our hopelessness, our frustration, the cynicism and cynicism, God, cynicism, God reminds us that he has made a promise. A savior was coming into the world, but not in the way that everybody expected. Jews thought that their messianic expectations were, were you know, uh, fireworks and, and loud bands. They believed that when, when, when the Messiah finally showed up, it would be a big, loud, momentous uh, moment. They thought there'd be no way in the world anybody could miss that the Messiah had shown up. I remember when I was a kid, um, I, I think it was about 1980, because I think it was in his first election campaign, Ronald Reagan came to Steubenville, Ohio. Now, that was big news for us, all right? Uh, I don't know who the previous first... 
I don't know if a president had ever gone through Steubenville, Ohio before, all right? Just to be very honest with you. And uh, I can remember Ronald Reagan going to come, and I'm telling you what, they closed down town for three days before he got there. I mean, there were so, I mean, everybody was ready for Ronald Reagan to arrive in our town. Everybody knew he was coming. And, and the Jews kind of thought, well, if, if a king is coming, if a Messiah is coming, He'll be welcomed with some type of fanfare, right? We've all seen the movies when the king rides into town. They're blowing trumpets. They're, they're, they're sounding horns. They're, 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 they're making a great tumult about, uh, here he comes. Uh, gee, you know, the Messiah is here. But in reality, Jesus is born in almost utter silence. No loud clap of thunder, no earth-shattering appearance. Rather, the Messiah would come quietly. You notice here the quietness of the Messiah's arrival, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem of Prathrith, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from, from among you, uh, for you shall, for, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to uh, be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is of old, from ancient of days. He warns us here that the Messiah would come quietly. When God's peace comes, when he brings peace in our lives, he does it quietly. So quietly sometimes that we almost miss it. You think about that. How many times in the scripture do you see God speak? I, you know, the, the classic example of this would be Moses. You know, he needs a fresh touch, a fresh revelation from God. And so he's there on the mountain and he's praying God for God to show himself. And you remember what happens? A big storm goes by. He sees the fire. He sees the thunder. He feels the earthquake. And each time God says, no, I'm not in that. And then finally, a still, small voice comes. I think many people show up at church looking for God's peace and they think that, God's going to shake the foundations of the building. He's going to yell and, and with a loud voice and, 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 and announce to them. It's going to be a, a, a momentous occasion. It's going to be something that, that's going to shake the very foundation. But, but God's peace more usually comes in a rather quiet, simple way. He, he reminds us here that the Messiah is coming from Bethlehem. Well, Bethlehem was about the last place you'd have picked for the Messiah to come from. By the way, if you knew your Bible, it should have been the first place you would look. It was the birthplace of King David. And, and as a descendant of David, it makes natural sense that Jesus would be born in the city of Bethlehem. It would be from that place that that's a strong connection with, with King David, that, that the Messiah would be born. But Bethlehem is, is it's an insignificant town. In fact, he has to be careful there. He has to make sure he mentions that it's Bethlehem Apathrith because there were two Bethlehems in the first century and, and one's a little bit larger and a little bit more significant. And he wants to know, no, it's not that one. It's not the one you think of. It's not the Bethlehem you all know. It's Bethlehem Apathrith. That little, small, insignificant hamlet. Uh, some Bible historians estimate that no more than maybe 100 people lived in this spot. It was just a very tiny, insignificant town that, that you would never notice, a place that, that most people would have just looked past, and yet God says, I have chosen that place. I want to say this to you. Did you know that when God chooses us, it's, it's amazing to me, God doesn't always choose the best looking, the most talented, now, I'm not saying he doesn't choose good-looking and talented people. Amen? He does. Some, I mean, you know, you obviously on your staff, you can see that, you know. He doesn't pick the smartest guy. He doesn't smart the wealthiest guy. He, he picks the most unusual of servants. Have you ever thought about that? I earnestly believe this. I earnestly believe that most of the time we as God's people look at all the wrong things when we're looking for, you know, every once in a while I'll have a, a, a pulpit committee call me for a friend of mine. They'll say, hey, pastor so-and-so has left, put you as a, a reference for, for on your resume. 
Could you tell me about this prayer? We're thinking about calling so-and-so uh, to be our pastor, and, and he's lifted you as a reference. I always like that. All right, that's a good way to make a little spare cash. If you, you, know, you call the guy and say, hey, uh, hey buddy, uh, they're, they're, they're calling me and ask, how bad do you want that job? Uh, no, I don't do that. But it always fascinates me what they're looking for. None of the characteristics that God looks for. They never ask me, is, is he humble? Is he pliable? Is, is, is God, is he, does he seem to be a person that's very responsive to the things of God? Is he, is he concerned about what people think or what God thinks? Is he willing to stand up and, and do what God tells him to do when, when maybe nobody else understands? They never ask me that question. Hey, let me ask you something. Uh, is he a good speaker? Can he, can he bring a good message? Have you ever thought about that? The greatest preacher in the history of the Christian church was the Apostle Paul. And Paul stuttered to the point that it was obviously such a difficult matter that the church in Corinth said, we don't want him to come back and preach here. We don't want that guy to be our leader. We don't, look, he, he doesn't speak with eloquence. He doesn't speak with, with, with a fluid tongue. He stutters. How could we possibly let somebody like that in the pulpit? You and I would sit there and go, he's Paul. The greatest preacher in the history of the church. And yet we would look right past him. See, insignificant doesn't mean that God is not going to use you. In our own ways, every one of us is insignificant, are we not? Have you ever thought about that? Billions of people have been on this earth before you. And probably billions will be here after you. And in one sense, that makes us pretty insignificant. You think about that. I heard a joke one time they said about, talking about China, they said there's so many people in China that even if you're a one in a million kind of a guy, there's still a thousand of you. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Even if you're a one in a billion kind of guy on this earth, there have been thousands just like you. And yet, as insignificant as we are, you're so significant that if you were the only person that ever lived, God still would have sent his son to die for you. And out of the billions who have lived and the billions who have died and the billions yet to come, God looked down the cord over time. And when he sent his son Jesus into that manger in Bethlehem and ultimately to a cross at Golgotha, he had you and he had me in mind. Amen? I don't know what to call that other than significant insignificance. Amen? In one sense, you don't have to get so caught up. You're, you're not unique in a lot of ways. Our problem is that we've been teaching our kids for a long time, they're unique. Can I make you, uh, you, you ain't no different than what we were when we were kids. I'm not knocking uniqueness, but it always amazes me that the people that talk the most about being unique dress like everyone else around them. Wear the same hair. We're not unique. We're just people. And yet in the midst of that, God loves you so much that he would send his son to die for you. That blows me away, doesn't it? I just, I just I marvel at that. That God loves us that much. Uh, that, that, that peace and that quiet comes that shalom, that peace comes quietly to even the most insignificant. Then he talks there about what the Messiah will bring. Notice what the Messiah will do. He mentions several things that Jesus would do. And look what he says there in, in verse number, uh, we'll just begin to read in verse number three. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand 
and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and, uh, of the earth, and he shall be their peace. There's several things that he mentions. First of all, he says he shall stand. That word stand is very, very important. In Hebrew, it's not just talking about he's going to be able to stand up and be able to walk. It's not what he's talking about. The word stand there is meaning he is going to rule. He is going to stand as their king. He is going to stand as their ruler. He's saying this Messiah who is coming is going to be the ruler of his people. And that's why in salvation, the New Testament tells us that we must confess that Jesus is Lord. The word Lord there means ruler, master. People will say this sometimes. They will say, well, you've got to make Jesus Lord of your life. I've got news for you. God's already made him Lord. You don't make Jesus Lord. You just acknowledge that he is Lord. You just acknowledge that he is in control or you stand opposed to him. You stand against his rule. And so he reminds us he has come to rule his people, but that's good news, amen? We need someone who can guide and direct and rule our lives. Now, by the way, Jesus does that in the most gracious and loving and kind way. He doesn't just stand up there and boss us around. Uh, I don't know that anybody today really responds to that kind of leadership. There was a day and an age when, when that's how they worked. Uh, my dad uh, uh, used to work in a steel mill, and he was a turn foreman. And he used to say, I don't care what those guys think. I've been working here for 40-some years. I know how to make steel. They don't know how to. They just do it the way I tell them to do it. And he never asked their opinion, never cared about their opinion, just said, that's the way you're going to do it. I'm the boss. If you don't do it my way, then you can go find another job somewhere else. That's the way he was. But that's not the way Jesus is, is he? You ever notice that Jesus comes along and he guides our life lovingly and graciously and kindly? Can I say this to you? Every once in a while, you're going to get out from, listen, you're going to wander out of God's will. As much as, as I would like to say as a pastor that I dedicate my life to, to, to living out the will of God and, and that's my desire and that's my hope and that's the thing I want to do, but can I be honest with you? There are moments when I stray. You know why? Because later on he's going to refer to Jesus as a shepherd. That makes me a sheep and sheep aren't that bright. <laughs> sheep will wander. We sing that song. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We're prone to wander. But, but you ever notice what? Jesus is a kind and gentle shepherd, and, and, and his first thing would be to try to pull us back and just redirect us back into his path. He didn't whip us. He didn't, he didn't hit us at first. He didn't get mad. He just tried to just gently guide and lead us. That's why we sing songs like uh, uh, Gentle Savior, and, 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 and we, we sing about him shepherding us. And kind of, now, if we continue on that, he'll get a little more aggressive, will he not? But don't you do that with your children? If you love your child and, and the first rebuke doesn't straighten them out, all right, doesn't kind of correct the behavior, what do you do? Then, then you, you, you begin to get a little more aggressive. You come and say, listen, you can't do that. And then you begin to say, I, I've got to chastise you. I've got, I've got to try to direct you back into that path. Well, that's how God is. He loves us, and he's not trying to just boss us around. He's trying to guide us and lead us in the paths of righteousness and to the ways that, that we should go. And that's why you'll notice he says, he shall stand and shepherd his flock. A shepherd always has the best interest of his sheep in mind. He, the shepherd's not out there looking for the most comfortable place. You know, when the shepherd gets his sheep together, he doesn't say, well, where can I find a pasture closest to the next Holiday Inn? You get what I'm saying? He doesn't go out and say, well, let me see if I can find a place that'll be comfortable for me. He says, I'm going to find a place that's going to be good for the shepherd or for the sheep. And where the sheep are, are, are the most comfortable is often places where the shepherd is rather uncomfortable. He's got he's to live out there in the, in the wilderness. He says, he's your shepherd. He guides, by, by the way, if you want evidence that Jesus did that, just look at the cross. Do you think that was a gentle, pleasant place to be? 
No, but the shepherd went to the cross to die for us, to pay the penalty. For, do you think it was fun leaving the glories of heaven to come down to earth and put on human flesh and all of a sudden have to endure pain and disappointment and struggles and difficulties? Why did he do that? Because he's a gentle, loving, kind shepherd. And he's experienced everything that you and I experience, and he wants to guide us and he wants to lead us. And I'm gonna tell you something, that's the kind of shepherd I want, amen? I want one who understands me, who, who has my best interest in mind. He says he shepherds his people. Now our problem is sometimes we want to be the shepherd. We want to be in control. Can I, can I, can I tell you something I figured out a long time ago? As long as I'm in control of my own life, I am going to mess it up. Y'all got that? I'm gonna mess it up. I'm gonna make bad decisions. So here's what I have to do. I have to place it in the hands of God. Now every once in a while, I'm still gonna mess it up. I'm still gonna make mistakes. But what I want to do and what my goal is and my desire, this is what your desire should be to say, listen, I just want to simply follow the shepherd. That's easy. The sheep can wander, and we do this all the time. I wonder where the shepherd's going. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder where he's taking us. See, does he know there was green, there was a green field right back there? We, we could have stopped right there. Hey, Jesus, there was water back there. And the shepherd just keeps on going and he keeps leading us. And, and, now, by the way, do you know what that sounds like to Jesus? Bah, bah. That's what we do all the time though, isn't it? Hey, I know a better way for my life. Hey, I know we ought to go there. Look, 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 look over there. And the problem is, is that sheep can't always see beyond the horizon. Do you know what the sheep's job is? The sheep's job is to follow the shepherd. Eat where the shepherd tells them to eat, drink where the shepherd tells them to drink. Lie down where the shepherd tells them to lie down, get up when the shepherd tells them to get up. That, can, can we all do that? Just follow the shepherd. That's what he said, he's gonna be the shepherd of his people, but not only that, he's gonna give us security. Look, he says, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. In the strength of the Lord, there is security. By the way, in our own strength, there's absolute insecurity. Think about that. You may be the strongest, baddest, toughest guy in the world. Have you ever felt there's someone out there that is badder and tougher than you are? I remember when I was in high school, we had, I ran around with a fellow named Mark. And, and I wasn't fat and out of shape like I am now. Now, you know, I don't think I could take on a two-year-old, let alone a, a grown-up. But, but me and Mark used to be, man, we were in good shape. Mark was the toughest guy in our high school. Woo, you did not want to mess with Mark. Mark would whip you seven ways to Tuesday. I mean, he would, uh, he, would, he would straighten you out if you got in his face. Mark was the toughest, baddest dude that ever graduated from Jefferson Union High School. He was bad. We used to say it to him. He's bad to the bone, all right? That's, that's guy. He's tough. He wore a black leather jacket to let everybody know I'm bad. One day we were at a high school basketball game and you know how basketball games get. You, you guys are worse about it than we are, just to be honest. Yeah, they started yelling back and forth. It's kind of like a Kentucky-Louisville game. Kind of like, you know, hey, they're yelling back and forth and they're screaming at each other. And after the game, this old boy, this, this kid was about that tall and, and he's just a little, little, little tiny guy. And he walked by and he said, hey, you two, we'll just take care of this in the parking lot. <laughs> okay, we'll go on. Oh, Mark walks out there, leather jacket and all. Three minutes later, we carried Mark out and we were singing, that dude's bad. That dude is tough. What in the world happened? Amen. If you dwell in your own security, you're gonna get whipped one of these days. If you, by the way, if you think that anything in this world gives you security, you have to think again. 
We live in a nation where we believe that our nation has brought us security. It does not. If you watch the news, you recognize just being in America and living in our borders does not make you secure. There are a lot of times we get our security from a job. When I was growing up, the most secure job in the world was a job at Weirton Steel Corporation. It was the third largest producer of steel, not in America, but in the world. It made more tin plate. If you drank out of a tin can from 1940 to 1990, you probably drank out of a can. If you, if you opened a can of beans, that can was probably made in Weirton, West Virginia. It's probably run off the 54 inch tin mill there in, in that mill. It was the, there was nothing more secure than a job at Weirton Steel. Guys went to college that, 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 that grew up around me. They'd go off to college. They'd go get a master's degree. They'd come back, and they wouldn't work in their chosen field. My brother-in-law went and got a teaching degree, came out of college, and realized he could make more on the labor gang at the steel mill than he could make teaching over at the high school. That's the way it was. There was nothing more secure than those jobs. At its height, it employed 15,000 men. Today, by the way, there were three other mills almost as big as it that were sitting right around us. They're all gone. That little mill there went from 15,000 down to 500 people. No one in their right mind would take a job there now. See, if our security's in this world, it can be quickly taken away. You think your security's in your health. Did you realize that one of these days, one of these days, going to catch something or get something that will kill you. If you don't believe me, ask anybody who's ever lived before you. Have you ever noticed that they all died? Someday we're going to get something that we don't get well from. We need security. We need something that's more secure than anything this world can give us. Amen? I don't know what you're placing your security in, but he reminds us here that, 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 that the strength of the Lord comes through the Messiah. Then finally he says, he shall be their peace. Peace doesn't come from having more. It doesn't have, it, it, peace doesn't come from having a lot of money in the bank for retirement. I know lots of people who have lots of money who don't have any peace. It doesn't come through a relationship on this earth. Oh, if I could just find, boy, if I could just find that one boy or that one girl who would love me. For, now, by the way, it's good to have a wife. It's good to have a husband. Amen? There's great joy in that. And there's, there's a wonderful relationship that's there. But if that's your source of peace, you're looking in the wrong place. Oh, if I could find, man, if I could just find peace, if I could just do enough things, religious things, if I could just be involved in enough ministry and read my Bible enough and pray enough, I could find peace. We've been talking about the history of the church on Wednesday nights. We've been looking at the different people. There have been lots of people all over the years. I thought if I could run off and I could join a monastery, I'd find peace in the monastery. I'd find peace if I could just have this or if I could have that. I want to say this to you. You find peace and your relationship with Jesus Christ. And your peace with everyone else comes through your relationship with Jesus Christ. And the peace that you have within yourself comes first through your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you try to have peace with other people and peace within yourself, but do not have peace with God, you will never experience true peace, true shalom. There's that old song that we sing really captures the idea. I don't think ever, I don't know that it ever mentions the word peace in it. But that old song that we sing every once in a while, it is well with my soul. That's a description of what God's talking about in this passage of peace. Peace is that sense that it is well with my soul. No matter what the world, by the way, that was written by a guy who had just lost his, his, his daughters in a terrible shipping accident. 
They had been killed and, and they had been taken from him. And, and he's writing about, and, and, about that, that, that episode and he's talking about where did his peace and where did, where did he find joy? Where did he find the strength to get through that awful and terrible experience? And it come through his relationship with God. And that's why he's saying, it is well with my soul. No matter what this world throws you, if it's well with your soul, if you are right with God, I'm not saying it'll be easy. And I'm not saying it'll never hurt. But I'm saying that you will be able to get through anything. Amen. You can have the peace of God in the midst of a world that knows no peace. Let's stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for reminding us that into a dark and terrible world, a world that's filled with all kinds of strife and difficulty, a world that's filled with sorrows and hopelessness, a world that is ravaged daily by sin, you sent your son Jesus to become our savior, to become our Lord, to become our peace. Lord, we're thankful for his death on the cross that has secured our salvation. I pray today, if there's anyone here today that's never, that's never known that salvation, never known that experience, Father, I pray today that you grant them peace, a peace that passes all understanding. Father, I pray that you'd speak to their hearts. I pray that you'd help them to trust only in you, not in their own works, not in their own actions not on the things that they try to do for you, but rather in what you've already done for them. And Father, I pray you'd help them to live out of the victory that's there. Lord, I thank you and praise you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.